it's Mez Meredith here with a nice live stream. We are live. Thought I'd, you know, mix things up and go with the headscarf for this one. You know, a little bit Copacabana. Um, as you can see, I'm joined by Bandit down there. There he is. Give him a little pet. There he is. And my hubby Sean is here for tech support. And to read out your questions or comments that you might have. So you'll see below me, there's a live comment section. And you can type stuff in and I will try and answer it during the live stream. But keep in mind, I'm in the future. I'm like 30 seconds ahead of you. Okay? Because, you know, the internet's got to do its thing. It's got to buffer. It's got to, it's got to do all that. So I'll try and get to them when I can. And Sean will kind of chime in and let me know when stuff's kind of, you know, relevant. Uh, so um, the first live stream went pretty well. Everyone was pretty stoked. I was pretty stoked. So I thought, hey, let's do another one. And this one is called How I Got That Shot from Capture to Post. And it is sponsored by the St. George Leagues Club Photographic Society. Massive shout out to those guys. They have had me come there for years. Oh my God, like five years to present and to judge their work and all kinds of stuff. And they're a really great bunch of people down there. And unfortunately at the moment, they can't physically meet for their you know photographic society meetings so that's why they asked me if I could do this live stream for them instead of being there in person so I hope you're all tuning in and, and I hope you find it interesting enough and, and I hope I don't blab on for too long which I tend to do as people know so I'll try and keep it like to an hour I'll try. So I'm going to try so hard to keep it to an hour. Um, but massive shout out to St. George Lee's Club for sponsoring this event. And look, if you feel like after this whole virus thing is over that, you know, you want to join a photographic society and you live in the St. George area of Sydney, I highly recommend that you contact them. Their link is below. So you can click through after the live stream and follow them on Facebook, check out what they're doing and, you know, get in contact and give it a go. Um, I also hear there's some other people from other photographic clubs um, like Ingleburn and Dooley's. Maybe some of you are here. Hi. You know, no one be shy. Make sure you ask questions and say hello. So I guess let's just get into it, okay? Um, so I kind of got the idea for this because after the last live stream, I asked everyone, like, what do you want me to talk about? You know what I mean? I don't just want to, like, talk about what I want to talk about. And some of the topics that people suggested to me were – um street photography because I shoot a lot of so this kind of like hold on I've got a hold on I've got a transition so this is kind of like what I'm going to be talking about look you see me up there in the top corner hi this is kind of what I'm going to be going through today I'm going to be going through street photography that was one thing everyone wanted to know about uh live edits so I've picked some landscapes that I'm going to just show you how I edited them uh Backlit portraits, because I shoot a lot of backlit portraits. So I'm going to show you how I do that. Like, you know, there's no sun in here. So I'll show you some photos and then I'll kind of talk to you about the process of how it's taken and then how it's edited. And a huge one that I got heaps of requests for was balancing camera flash, on camera flash. Huge one. And really like a good thing to know how to do it properly because so many people do it wrong. So many people do it wrong. So we're going to talk about that as well. And then there's some other little things kind of thrown in just to keep it fun and interesting. And I've kind of chosen two sort of major shoots that I did. The first one we'll be seeing is big groups, animals and nudes. So look, you're not going to see like fully nude people. But if you are under the age of 13, you probably should not be watching this. So if my niece is watching, Sophia, maybe come back in like 15 minutes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> But there's no full nudes, so no one worry. It is sort of family friendly, but not. But I think I chose this uh, shoot that I did for the Sydney Uni Veterinary School uh, because it kind of encompassed a lot of different things. So it was for their annual nude calendar that they do for charity. And I, it was probably one of the hardest shoots I ever had to do because it was 40 people, farmyard animals, 
in locations I'd never been to with people I'd never met and I did it for free because it was for charity. So I think we're going to start off with that. So here's some of the photos from the calendar and I'm just going to go through a few and then I'm going to kind of get more into like how did I shoot this, okay? Because I did it for free. Uh, because I think it was uh, they were fundraising for uh, mental health care for vets. And so the whole thing was like shedding the stigma, shedding clothes, shedding the stigma of mental health. And they made like a ton of money. They made like 20 grand or something for this these mental health charities that help out vets because vets, you know, they, they can suffer quite badly from mental health. And so this is some of, yeah, this is some of the photos. So it was shot out in Camden, south of Sydney, uh, on the Sydney Uni Veterinary Campus. You know, like they have all these farms out there. How they then they learn like how to you know I don't know desex animals, how to worm them, how to take care of them, how farming works. You know, all that kind of stuff. And yeah, they got in contact with me to see if I'd be willing, you know, to donate my time and do it. And, um, and I said, yeah, yeah, of course, of course I'll donate my time. I rarely donate my time, but I thought it was a, a really great cause and, um, it was really fun, but yeah, it was, it was really hard. Um, so yeah, there was like 40 students and, um, I shot it with my friend Toby, who I do my podcast with, shout out to Tobes. And he basically was, I boss him around so much, the poor guy. He carried all my stuff and he set up all the lighting gear for me and, and all that. But this, this shoot was hard because I had to direct so many different people and animals. I mean, oh my God, who works with animals? It's just terrible. It's a terrible idea. But um, one of the things that I really uh, had to make sure of before doing the shoot was that uh, you know, all the animals were going to be treated well. Um, they weren't going to be mishandled. So that was really important to me. So I had lots of conversation back and forth with the students who were sort of leading the whole project. And, you know, I had to ensure in my own mind that, you know, they had all the best intentions at heart. And they do. I mean, they're vets, for God's sake. They love animals. And that during the shoot, we weren't going to stress out the animals or mishandle the animals. And we actually had two professional animal handlers there on the day which was fantastic because like oh my god could you even imagine um and we yeah and oh my gosh it was just a crazy shoot I'm just like it's all coming back to me I'm just remembering it all um and I had to ensure that everyone was going to feel comfortable and safe so I had to create an environment from the very beginning of safety because these people are nude in front of me they don't know me um, and I had to be very particular with, with how I spoke to them. And so the first thing that we established was a safe word, like legit a safe word. And because I, I, I figured a safe word was going to be a better idea than someone having to come up to me and saying, Mez, I'm not really comfortable with this because A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Because I think that's a lot harder to say than just to yell out a safe word. So the safe word was pineapple. And so anytime someone felt uncomfortable in a situation or with something I'd ask them to do, they would go pineapple and sweet. We just didn't do it or we changed it or we moved along. And, and that really helped. So like biggest piece of advice, if you're ever shooting nudes, like 100% have a safe word. Like, oh my God, do. And also like at the beginning of the shoot, you know, we all got around and we had a meeting and I introduced myself and I just tried to create, yeah, this space of the telling them that they could say anything to me and it would be okay. Um, and that, yeah, if they were uncomfortable, they let me know with the safe word and that I was willing to have ideas thrown at me. I mean, there was 40 of them, you know, and, but also at the same time, I had to make it very clear that I was the boss and they had to listen to me because when you get lots of people together, the number one thing they want to do is what? They want to chat with each other. They want to chat, 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 chat. And if they're chatting, 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 chatting and I'm trying to direct a very hard situation um, with animals and nude people, they have to be listening to me. So I made it very clear to them that they had to listen to me and that if I kind of got really blunt with them and sharp with them, 
that they weren't to be offended, that I was just trying to, you know, get everyone to focus. So that's really important. So if you have a huge group, have a talk before you start your shoot, no matter what it is. If it's like a big wedding or some kind of other group shot, make sure you just have like a collective chat at the beginning. Keep it light. Keep it like, hey, this is going to be great. You know, let me know if you're feeling uncomfortable. Let me know like, you know, how you're going, blah, blah, blah. Um, so yeah, they were all extremely nice people and pretty much, look, they were willing to do anything. So, (laughs) so that was good. Um, but yeah, having that safe word and creating an environment where they could feel like they could say anything to me was great. But the whole shoot was like thinking on my feet for 12 hours straight. I'd never been to these locations. I had no idea what the weather was going to be like. And the weather was actually like kind of the worst weather you could have because it was besides rain it was sunny cloudy so you'd set up a shot and it'd be like sunny and you get the lighting right perfect and then a freaking cloud would come over for like 10 minutes and you'd be like no I gotta change the lighting setup so I had to think on my feet like so fast and obviously like working with animals was quite difficult I'll just go back to a shot and tell you a funny story So I was setting up this shot and so it's shot with flash at the front and then there's actually a flash behind the the three women next to the guy with the hat. Um, So there's a flash behind them giving them a bit of backlight. Anyway, this pig, I think its name was Edwina, can't remember. It didn't like me. It was like, why are you here? I know these people. I don't know you. what are you doing? And so as I was setting up the flash behind the three girls, like where the flash was going to be, Edwina decided to sneak up behind me, put her, and she's big. Like you can see, look how big she is, man. She put her snout in between my legs and lifted me into the air, into the air. And I was like, oh my God, it was hilarious. I, I laughed so hard so hard but I was fine it was fine it was fine I was scared of her though after that but she was a very good girl I mean look how well she posed it it was like she'd done it before great job Edwina and it was funny because when I got home bandit he couldn't believe how I smelled he was like where have you been oh my god what's all these smells so that was pretty funny um oh these girls were great they were awesome So uh, as, and I'll show you how I plan the shoot beforehand, but a lot of the time, you know, you plan a shoot and then you get there and it's like, oh, okay, that's going to go out the window and this is kind of what I'm going to do, especially with a shoot where there's like 10 different locations and 40 different people. Like this shot, I, I didn't even tend to get this shot. We were wrapping for the day and I saw this light and I was like, quick, people get their clothes off and walk towards the light and obviously by then we all knew each other quite well and they were like sweet got their kid off and walked towards the light and it was a great shot um this was sort of one of the last shots we did this was like the big kind of group photo at the end in a huge barn and, and that was pretty fun but it was like the attention I had to have to detail for every single person so like I'd set it up And then I'd go through each person. I had to make sure that nothing was showing, if you know what I'm saying. And that everyone felt comfortable. Like, are you comfortable sitting here and doing this? Yes. Or pineapple. If it was pineapple, I'd move them or whatever. And also, you know, I would give them something to act out. And I'm going to talk a bit more about directing later. I don't just get them to stand there and then I go, okay, snap, snap. No, 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 no. I'm like constantly talking to them, telling them different things to do, giving them little like scenes to act out with each other. You know, you can see the two guys on the bike. I'm like, okay, you guys look at each other, have a laugh. And then, you know, the three on the right, you guys put your hand on his shoulder. Look, all of you cross your legs, blah, blah, blah. So I'm giving everyone like a, like a scene to play out when I hit action, because if I don't do that, they're just sitting there naked and they don't know what to do. <laughs> so I have to constantly be talking to them, directing them through it, giving them a scene or an action to do, and then also giving them positive feedback. You're doing great. That looks good. Fantastic. Yes. Oh my gosh. 
And you'll hear that later. I've got some videos of me directing them. But that's really important. And look, that translates to any group shot. Like if you're shooting a wedding party, like you have to give them actions and things to do and you have to give them positive feedback. I even show them photos. I'm like, oh my God, how good does this look? And people froth over that. They, they get more comfortable. That's how people get comfortable. Okay, so obviously I've talked a little bit about this, but putting people at ease. So very important to have that safe word um, if you're in a situation like this, but also like just to bring your personality. You know, you don't want to be too over the top unless the situation calls for it. You want to be, you know, calm, relaxed, easygoing, fun. You know, if, if you come in and you're serious or you're shy with a group of people, that's just not going to work. Like it's not going to work for you. So one of the ways we like I put everyone at ease also was they were only nude when they needed to be. So we would set up the shot and we'd set up the lighting and everything with their clothes on. Obviously, some people just liked being naked. There's two people in that shot who just like, I don't care. I'm just going to leave my clothes off. That's fine. That's their choice. But yeah, I would get everyone to, you know, chuck your clothes on. They'd come in, we'd set up the scene and then right as we're about to shoot, it's like close off and I had other students who would grab their clothes and then it'd be like bam, bam, bam and we'd only really shoot for like maximum five minutes and then it'd be close back on, you know, yes, we got the shot, it's in the can, next location because like I had to shoot a whole calendar in a day. So again, this is from one of the, the shots. They're all clothed. We do a run through of what I want them to do and then we do it again with the clothes off and then it's quickly clothes back on and sweet as. And at the beginning of every scene with different people, because obviously they're not all in every shot, anyone who didn't need to be there was not there. So the people behind me is like Toby, my friend who I shoot with all the time, uh, the animal handlers and the clothes assistants, which is like two, two other students who are there to grab clothes and hand clothes back on. Anyone else who didn't need to be there was not there. Um, yeah, that, uh, that you, that's almost a closed set. But it was funny, actually, when we shot this, there was, oh, sorry, there was, um, there was a guy across the road who was like having a good old perv. And I had to like tell him, I'm sorry, but like, can you like not perv? Like, can you go back in your house? And there was some, some words exchanged, one might say. But um, I had another situation like that during the shoot that I'll talk about later. But I think it's important too that on this shoot, I kind of felt like I, I was responsible for everyone. Like I was responsible for their safety. I was, I was leading the charge. I was in charge. And I was responsible for them feeling comfortable. One other thing that I felt like put everyone at ease was giving them the input to help with setting things up, brainstorming ideas. It wasn't just like this thing where I was like, you have to listen to everything I was saying. So this is just like a little tiny video outtake thing that Toby just snatched. And you'll see that the students are setting up the scene. Oh, you got it? Yes. <laughs> get it all in. Get all the property in. Ready. We can get... Okay. So that's just like a little, you know, video. So you can see they're, they're having input. What do we want in the shot? Okay, that gives them agency over the shot. It puts them more at ease about the shot, okay? So it's not just me doing everything. Okay, directing. Like obviously directing is so important. I can't just tell them, okay, get nude and click, click. No. So in this video, you'll kind of see just a little bit of how I did the run through with these six girls. And you can hear me chatting a little bit. I say, yes, great, doing great job. But I've given them this action. Line up in threes. You guys walk first. Then you walk second. And then come, turn, and walk back. You go, go. Yeah, 
get it? Dress rehearsal. Okay, perfect. I will just. Okay, so you can see there. I'm just. That's the run through. And you could see there the girl in the uh, in the green. She was one of the animal handlers. I think her name was Liz from memory. She was awesome. Oh my god! Shout out to Liz. I could not have done this without Liz. Her animal handling skills, like oh my gosh, amazing, amazing. So this is a, a scene we had um, with some Dalmatians and some nude men, uh, and you'll get a really good insight to how I'm directing them and how I'm talking to them and how I'm getting them to do things. I'm a little bit blunt with them in this shoot, but this was kind of towards the end of the day and we kind of all just like got to know each other. Yeah, yeah. Are you chewing gum? Are you chewing gum in the middle? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, can you swallow it or chuck it? Yeah. Go on. Because it makes you look funny. Yeah, you're Where just causing all the problems. Yeah. <laughs> this one's loving Anthony's hair. I know. Oh, my God. Anthony's hair is... Hey, Anthony, like can you get smushier with Killian? Because I can see your jocks. And now, Adrian, you got to get, you all really got to squish. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Nice, boys. Smiles, yeah. Not to the camera, smiles to your dog. Killian, you're killing me. Don't put your head behind the dog. I'm trying not to. He's, I know, but. He's very tall. He's very tall. Yeah, little booby. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my God, I'm dying. I'm dying. This is the shot. This is the shot. <laughs> Okay, so you heard me say there at the end, oh my God, this is the shot, this is the shot. And so this was that last little bit. And it's it's good to note, they weren't naked. I just made it look like they were. They have their undies on. So if they didn't need to be naked, they were not naked. And he is, he, yes, most of them are naked here. This is another version of that shot. So uh, like... Uh, yeah, look, it was a lot. They were all very nice and very respect respectable to each other, I, I should add. They were just great kids in their 20s. I'm 100. <laughs> so how I shot most of it was using off-camera flash. So I couldn't bring these back here, these lights, because they require power and I don't, I don't own battery powered studio flash I just don't own it I don't really have a need for it at all um so I used I used a speed light on a stand with a shoot through umbrella or an umbrella with a sil like a silver back that you know bounced it back that's what I used because I knew it was going to be 12 hours of shooting and even if I had a battery powered studio flash I, I that wouldn't have lasted me 12 hours so I chose the speed lights to use uh, with the remote trigger because I had two of them I used the other one on a little stand for backlight if I needed it or if I needed extra power to overpower the sun so that's how I that's what I used to, to shoot the whole thing but some shots are just natural like the dog natural light the dog shot you just saw that's all natural light so how, how do you balance? And I'm going to talk more about balancing flash later when we talk about on-camera flash, but it's so simple. You get an ambient light reading of the scene that you're happy with, and then you fill the rest with flash. Boom. So you either on your um, speed light, you hit ETTL and it'll decide for you. It'll decide on the amount of light that's reflecting back off the subject, or you use manual, which is what I do. Because ETTL can sometimes be all over the shop. It can be like, oh, too bright, oh, too soft, uh, you know what I mean? So I usually like tuck it straight onto manual and then I change the power settings uh, manually. So I'll go like an eighth or a sixteenth or, you know, one over one, like full power if it's the sun. And that, and so I'll do that. And then when I'm happy with how the light looks, then I can just keep going. And as long as the ambient light doesn't change, then I'm fine. So you get your ambient light reading and then you fill the flash in. And I've got some examples. So this is that scene you saw before. This is without flash. So I get the ambient light reading and you can see this is a difficult scene. You've got very dark shadows and you've got a highlight there in the back. So I had to decide on an exposure that kept the highlights I wanted and kept shadows I wanted. And I sort of just got it. I probably exposed for the, the light the light in the, oh, I don't even know where I'm pointing, the light down there on the gravel, that's probably what I exposed for. And then I might've gone maybe like a third over. And then the flash, 
looks like that. So obviously that's like a more edited, the color temperature is a bit different there, but I'll go back and forth. So without flash, dull, boring. So if I wanted to get them exposed correctly, the whole back would have been blown out, okay? Flash. And the trick is you chuck people in open shade and you can use flash to your heart's content. That's like best tip ever. So this is using flash when they're sort of like in direct sunlight. So obviously like the sun is back up to the right of the frame and they're total, almost totally backlit somewhat and it's like midday. That was the thing. I couldn't choose to shoot sunset, sunrise, beautiful, beautiful. I had to shoot for 12 solid hours to get, you know, 16 sort of different scenes in the can for this calendar. And so this is the shot sort of setting up without flash. So I kind of expose sort of for the grass, this sort of mid-tone up here near the water and the tree. And then I fill the rest with flash. So you see, this is it filled with flash. And I probably went maybe half a stop over from the last shot. And you can see here in the, in the top left, there's my speed light going off, bouncing back into the reflector and then onto them. So without flash, it would have just been like harsh or I, the whole back would have been blown out if I exposed for their skin tone. So ambient light reading, then you use flash to fill, okay? And we'll talk more about that later with on-camera flash. Okay, so what was the final product? Okay, so I went there, I shot all this stuff. Like I said, so they did a calendar. I've got it here. So they sold like, they made like 20 grand or something. And this is it here. <laughs> I didn't print it. I had nothing to do with the design. They did that. I just sent them the photos, told them what I thought they should use, obviously. Um, and yeah, and then like, so they made this cool calendar and they freaking sold heaps of them. Some more photos in there. And yes, they kindly sent me some. There's a nice photo on the back there. So they kindly, they kindly sent me some. That was very nice of them. But this thing got so much PR, I can't even begin to tell you, right? So this, so we're on Channel 7 News, like at 6 p.m., like prime time, Sydney prime time. So I shot this with my phone when it was on. I was like, oh, my God, we're on TV. Um, and it'll be a little soft, so I'm actually going to turn up the volume for you. So just watch it and please take note of the newsreader's <laughs> final thoughts at the end. It's very funny. Last year they raised money for greyhounds. This year it's to help farmers struggling with their mental health. You might say the snaps are cheeky, leaving not much to the imagination. Certainly one way to capture a student body. There were blueprints, there were definitely blueprints. Vet students from Sydney Uni stripped bare, all in the name of art, a nude calendar. First, shedding their inhibitions. <laughs> it definitely starts off like very novel. Some made sure they were well prepared. I've uh, had a few comments from friends. While it was a little hard to explain to the parents. I had to convince my mum. Um, we're trying to shed our clothes to shed the stigma around mental health. Getting their kid off for a good cause, rural and remote mental health. The pictures might be a little risque, but for the cause, the stakes are high. The rate of suicide among farmers is four times higher and the charity runs programs reaching out. The calendar is a vet student tradition which started in 2004. <laughs> Their clothes felt weird, so... <laughs> Last year they raised over $10,000 for greyhound rescues, a figure they should have no problem beating this year. Serena Nastasi, 7 News. Great work. Great. Okay, so the, the newsreader at the end really cracks me up. Uh, we had one question about the tractor shot. Did I just use one flash? Yes, I did. That was it. Did I? Yeah, that was it. One flash. Umbrella. Mate, you got an umbrella? It's like a big massive softbox. And it was probably like to, it was to my left, so where the light is on that side. And it was just, yeah, shooting across, flat right on them. It's nothing fancy. This is the thing. They asked me to do it for free. I had one day. I'm not going to go like full Vogue 
I'm going to go like, I'm not going to go Vogue editorial on this. I'm going to give them what they want and do a really good job with like the resources that I have for that time frame. And that's something that you have to think about for each shoot. You know what I mean? So go back. So yeah, so it got a lot of, and it was on Triple J Hack. They made their own video from our footage. Toby, my partner in crime, he shot all that B-roll. Um, I'll give you his socials at the end as well. He's a great dude. He's an awesome photographer. And, yeah, he we gave them all of our sort of B-roll. And, yeah, so Channel 7 used it and Triple J Hack used it and they made their own video, which I think is still up online somewhere. But you can see it had like half a million views. Like what? That's crazy. Obviously, hello, nude people. But um, I think they just did, like as a student body, they just did such a great job with the level of um, – uh, like the level of um, what's the word um, uh, like exposure they gave to this really huge issue of vets having you know mental health issues and they raised so much money and I was so proud of them I was so happy to be a part of it so yeah like I hope that kind of oh yeah there's the channel 7 thing which you just saw but I hope, yeah, oh, okay, so before we get off the nude people, I'm just going to quickly talk about, like, planning in terms of, like, like paperwork, okay? So the number one thing I had to make sure of was that I had a goddamn model release because I wasn't about to photograph 40 nude people and then, you know, do something like this and one of them complain. Do you know what I mean? So I had like an ironclad model release and, and they basically signed away all their rights to me. That sounds terrible, but you, you come on, we're photographers, we understand. Um, and I also had a licensing agreement that I had written up um, for them and it was for the student body and for the university itself that they could use the images and how they could use them and that if they used them in ways that defamed anyone that I was not held liable so that's really important like all that legal stuff is important even though yes I'm shooting it for free and it's for charity and yay no I have to protect myself especially when I'm photographing people in the nude and no one got photographed if they didn't have their model release they didn't have their model release. That was it. They they weren't included. I'm sorry. You're not included. So all that stuff is really, really important. And also, like, before I do any shoot, I make storyboards. I've got some down here. I do this. Years ago, I lived next door to this French guy who's an animator, and he had all these storyboards that he gave me. Oh, okay. Oh, yes, I'll go full screen with my webcam, Sean. I will. So it's like these kind of storyboards and I just draw our ideas out and I do the actions and what I think the lighting's going to kind of be and I do all that before a big shoot like a styled shoot um, because it sets it in my mind what I'm going to do and like I said like obviously some of that goes out the window when you arrive but for this shoot like a lot of, I kept a lot of it um, so yeah so you got to plan you got to protect yourself legally and, and you got to plan well. That's me in the pig stall. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Getting off nude vets. Sorry, guys. Um, so I'm just going to go through two landscape shots um, that I recently took when I, I drove across Australia last year for four months in my combi with my husband and my dog who's down there. Um, and I'm just picking two shots here to kind of go through – how I edited them so I'm going to be opening up Lightroom and look I'm not going to get too like wanky full detail here I pretty much just want to show you like a couple of things um, that I do in my process and like some new things that I've been trying out so I'm just going to transition into Lightroom guys so this is my screen hello and I'm just going to open up Lightroom so this is how the image comes out as a raw and so this is shot at cactus beach humongous sand dunes i shot this out of my car window in the pouring rain no tripod the whole deal so it's iso 160 105 mil and f9 okay that doesn't really matter but i'm just telling you so this is how it comes out of camera it's very different to how it ends up so you see down here the final product that's that's what I ended up as on an edit. 
So to start with, it's obviously very flat because it's a raw file and we kind of like need to build some tonality into that and some attitude, okay, and to get that color balance right. So the first thing I usually do before anything, because whenever I import, it always goes to Adobe Color and I'm sure that I can change that somehow, but I just don't. Um, so over in my little develop mode here in the top left, I have presets that I've made, all different kinds of presets for different things. But usually what I do is I have this thing called back to zero and it just takes it back to camera neutral and it takes like anything that Lightroom's going to try and add. And I also, I add my sharpening at this point actually, and I add my remove chromatic aberration at this point. So it just goes, takes it straight back to as flat as it can be. And then I start building an edit from that. So this is like kind of like my first go over edit and I'm not going to go through everything with you. I'm going to go through range masking with you on this afterwards. So you can see like I just boost the exposure a bit. I'm playing with the whites in it because if you ever go to camera neutral, it flattens your whites so bad. I add a nice sort of contrasty characteristic curve down here. If you're adding contrast not with your curve you sort of need to kind of do that because it gives you a lot more control it's much better than just using this contrast uh, module here or just using the sliders in your tone curve using the points on a tone curve is always going to give you like so much more control over your contrast and your tonality so if you're not comfortable with tone curves start to educate yourself on that go watch some like youtube videos and there's plenty of people out there doing good stuff but if you're not like editing with tone curve I, I don't know I just I don't rely too much on sliders um so yeah boosting my whites here bringing my blacks down and I this is something in the in the um vibrance and saturation I kind of always do is I always boost the vibra the vibrance and take away the saturation this is like not something I want you to carbon copy this is just like my style and how I like to see things this is how I edit I edit for me can you take that off him Sorry, my dog's just chewing something and it's really annoying. Um, and then look, go further down. And I do like a lot of color control in my HSL uh, palette. So you can see here all these different finite edits that I'm doing. And that just is so much better than boosting overall saturation. Like that's a global, what we call like a global adjustment. And it's okay to do that to an extent. But you want to just be like boosting and pulling away saturation from certain color areas that you think the photo needs. Uh, down here, split toning. I haven't done any split toning on this yet. And yeah, that's pretty much like the first like wave of edit that I'll do. And that's nice. That's not too bad, right? So then I'll just go to like sort of the next kind of vibe that I went for. So you can see here in the sand, it's got a lot more attitude now, a lot more texture, a lot more clarity. There's a lot going on there. And how I do that is with um, range masking using the brush. So you can see here, I've got it on here already and I'll just show you where it is. It is, there's two actually. There's one down here and hold on, I can show you the luminance mask. Okay, so this is, the red is where this is happening and being applied to, okay? And I'll just take that off for a minute. And Andy, stop. Sorry, my dog's just being really annoying. Give me one second. Can you just take it off him? Sorry, Bandit, I took his toy away, he hates me. Okay, so sorry, back to this. So you can see here where I've painted in this mask, okay? So I've gotten the brush and I've painted this in. You can see what it is. It's I'm pulling down exposure, I'm pulling down shadows and I'm pulling down blacks and I'm taking away saturation. So I'm darkening the dark areas, okay? And I can just do that without you know, using this luminance mask. But what it's going to do is it's going to darken the highlights in the in this in this sand dune as well as darkening the shadows so what i do with the range mask is i tell it to only affect the dark areas and i can do that now for you to start with so i'm going to go back to this one the palette so here we go we've got our brush up here we're going to bring down the exposure this is going to be like a crude version of it so you can really see how it works bringing down shadows bringing down blacks bringing down shadows da, da, da. here's the brush 
paint it in. Look, it's so crude. Oh, my God. All right. Bring that down. Yes. Oh, my God. Doesn't that look good? Said no one ever. Okay. So this is just showing you how this tool works. Okay. So that's kind of like really looks horrible, right? So if I go here to my range mask and I select illuminance, okay, then I end up here with this range, okay? So this is like your, your grayscale. Whites is over here on the right. Dark black is over here on the left. Now I can bring these together and I'm telling it only apply those adjustments to the dark areas of my image. You see there? So you see what happened there? So I'm going back. That's how it was when I painted it over. Now I'm bringing this in and I'm telling it only affect the darker areas of my image because what I wanted to do was to only like give those shadows and those blacks more attitude, okay? So if I did that as a global adjustment, it would also affect the sky and, and I don't necessarily want to do that, okay? So it's a really good tool to use. Obviously, like that is a very crude illustration of it. So you can just like, you know, bring it back a little bit there. Maybe bring the shadows down a bit more instead, a bit more of the black. And yeah, you can, obviously when I, you're doing anything with darks, you know, you, your saturation is going to boost a bit more. So I might boost, just bring that down a bit. So the same can be said for lights. Okay, so I can do another one. New brush and just double tap effect to get it back to zero. So I'm going to add a little bit of exposure, super highlights, and super whites. Again, I'm showing you very crudely how this tool works. Paint it over. Oh, yeah. Get that going. See how I'm not caring that I'm going in the sky? It's like it's all good. It's all right. Okay. Go down to the mask, range mask, luminance. Here is our range. So instead of telling it only affect the shadow areas, I'm going to tell it to affect the only the lighter areas of the image. Okay. So that is going to boost those highlights on that sand dune. So you can sort of see, oh, and it's going to affect the sky just a little bit. You can always erase that later. So you see, see how it's boosting? See, it's subtle. So hold on. If I get my little erase bit here, because we went a bit too, how are you going here? Let's get rid of that. Boom, 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 boom. See you later. So that's a very crude, quick version of that. But Range masking is like, it's so amazing. And you can do it with gradients as well. And I've got another image that I'm going to show you with gradients. So that's what I did on this version. So here, this was the level that I wanted to go to. I did two brushes for shadows and highlights of those sand dunes just to make them more punchier, give them a bit more attitude. And then the next step I went was with the clouds. So obviously... It's brighter on the left because that's obviously where the, where the sun was behind the clouds. So I've done this with a gradient tool. So you can see here where the gradient tool is working. So we'll let that, see how that's going red. That's where it's affecting. And what I did is I used the range mask on this as well. So I'll show you how to do that. So I'm going to go back to this sort of flat version here. And I'm going to get my gradient tool okay bring it back to zero sorry if you're missing anything because i'm going too fast you can watch this again later bringing down exposure bringing down shadows and let's bring that in okay so you see so i'm going to do it a bit more just so you can see it really working bringing it down so what's happening it's hitting the dunes all right oh i don't want it to hit the dunes what am i going to do well there's an answer for that range mask so instead of using luminance I'm going to use color color and I get my little color picker over here okay and I'm only going to tell it to affect this sort of bluer areas it's two very different colors here you got the sandy colored orange of the dunes and the blue sort of gray of the sky so I can either do a point select so just tap points and hit shift to select multiple points but I find I don't necessarily I don't really like that way of doing it so I'll reset it oh hold on reset the whole thing hold on bring that back down all the way down and bit 
more of that. Now you can really see it. So again, color, get my eyedropper and I'm going to do like areas. So I'm clicking and dragging. Then I'm holding in shift. I'm clicking and dragging more different tonality areas. Okay. More different color areas. Obviously, if I selected the dunes, it would affect the dunes. So I'm not selecting the dunes. Okay. Okay. So I've got my five points. So you can see if we go all the way here, it's not affecting the dunes. Okay. So let's get that to about here so you can see this effect that it has that you've got to make sure oh sugar that you don't oh no that you don't bugger up so if I zoom in so you see how it creates this horrible line like oh my god that is so gross it's because I've gone like too far with this and also there is this area here called amount now if I go all the way to the left it gets more crude you see that right if I go all the way to the right, it gets less crude, but it will sort of start affecting the top of your sand dunes there. But the way to get around that is simply by selecting your color range, you know, more precisely. I just sort of like whipped it through then. And also like anything, anything in post-production, don't go overboard. Oh my God, like there's no need for it to be that freaking dark. Like there's absolutely no need. I can pull my gradient up a bit there's no need for it to be so dark it, it you know the sky has a natural gradient you know so you can see there with the red that's where it's affecting okay and so that's so even with these tools you have to watch you have to watch like everything like has a after effect so that's not so bad but obviously I just did that very crudely so this is obviously how it turned out in the end with the version that I liked. And if I zoom in for you, you can see I don't have any of that harsh line. So it's all about balance. It's just like using that tool and finessing it, okay? So the final step I did was obviously like it's way too dark on one side of the sky because of where the sun was. So I added another gradient tool at the end to level it out. And so that is basically the finished product. So you can see this is what we started out with. Flat, obviously. It's a raw image. And we get to this as our final product. That's, uh, that's amazing, Thank you, Steph. Steph just said, that's amazing, Meredith. Oh my God, Range Mask is going to change your freaking life. But please, like with any tool in Photoshop or Lightroom, do not over use it and you don't have to use it on everything I probably only use this sometimes like sometimes and I'm gonna show you another image uh that I use it on um oh, actually no I'm gonna stay let's stay in Lightroom let's do it so this is one of my favorite images from the trip that I took last year so just let that load fully so we don't get that banding problem so this is taken at the Pinnacles in, in Western Australia. It was a full moon rising right at dusk. And I'm going to show you how I edited this image now. Okay. Pretty much the same kind of way. But this is what the raw looks like. Okay. So like with everything, my first step as soon as I bring it into Lightroom is I take it, everything back to zero. I make sure this is camera neutral because I get way more highlights, okay? So at the time of capture, what is going through my mind when I have a situation where what I'm seeing in real life is, is not, I know it's not going to translate to a raw image. So actually, I will go back into, whoops, oh, that's my calendar. Hey, you know what I'm doing. Um, if I go back to our little slideshow here, Okay, and I show you, so obviously that's the image, and this is me taking the image. I, I'm very lucky that my husband is a paparazzo. <laughs> okay, so look, obviously love a good uh, heel kick uh, when the time is right. So let's go back into Lightroom, okay? 
So you can see just from that video, those like electric, even though obviously it's like an iPhone, but what I'm seeing with my eyes is like electric pinks, purples. I can see that full moon rising. I can see all the detail in that moon. I can see all the details in that shadow because I'm a human and my eyeballs are always going to have more subject brightness range than your digital sensor. So from years of experience of, of photographing different things, I know, I know the minute I take that shot, the kind of exposure I'm going to need so that I can still have highlights and still have shadows. And so, and I, sometimes I even look on my hints, hit my histogram to make sure I don't lose highlights like this moon here. Okay. I, I need to have detail in that highlight. Otherwise it's blown out and then the photo's just going to be sh crap. It's just going to look terrible. Okay. So I probably shot this it looks about a full stop under mid gray, under what your meter is telling you. So that's probably what I shot it at from memory. And then I know that I can bring all the attitude back into it later in Lightroom. Okay. If I'd have shot this in JPEG, it would be, yes, very saturated and, and stuff like that. But I probably, that moon would probably have been blown out. And the trick to photographing full moons and getting like, light and information in your foreground of your scene is you have to shoot it when it's just rising like it, if it's not in that lower part of the horizon and it's way up in the sky it's always going to be too bright like always because when it's lower on the horizon it has atmospheric haze you know from pollution or just from the earth's atmosphere that is shielding the moon and it's taking it down a couple of stops as soon as you get out of that atmospheric haze on the horizon it gets super bright and it gets looks smaller so when it's lower it looks bigger and it's protected it's it's almost like a big sort of diffuser on it from the atmospheric haze so that's the best time to shoot a full moon is when it's rising don't bother shooting it when it's way up in the sky unless, you know, you're just shooting the moon itself. So timing's everything. And I didn't even know it was going to be a full moon rising when we were here. And I was just like, oh my God, this is amazing. So yes, this is the, obviously this is the final product. And look, there's a lot of attitude going on in this shot because I wanted it to replicate what I was seeing. Plus, you know, a little bit of extra oomph. Okay. So I'm going to go into this sort of version of it where we don't have any masking on it okay and I'm gonna show you a way like just what we did with the range mask okay but this time we're gonna use it for the sky and then some highlights in the foreground all right so we'll just make sure we've got nothing on that so okay bring the effect back down to zero if no one knows double tap on effect change my life my friend Amber told me that never knew it so I'm going to bring down the exposure a little bit. Again, I'm going to do this very crassly, okay? Like obviously I would do finesse this in, in my own time. I'm bringing down the highlights. I'm bringing down the exposure and let's give it like a little bit of saturation, okay? Now we're going to do a gradient. So let's bring it down. Now what's happening? Oh, the rocks, they're getting affected. Oh, damn, what do I do? Okay, you can see I go to the range mask. Yeah. So instead of using luminance, I'm going to use color because the colors are very different. The sky is extremely purple. The foreground is extremely red and orange. So I'm going to get a better effect if I'm choosing color. So again, get my little dropper and I'm going to choose different areas. So I'm going to choose this area. Then I'm going to hold in shift and I'm going to choose this area. And you can already see it's changing. And I'm going to choose this area and then maybe even this area. Here. Okay. So put the eyedropper back and I'll just zoom in. And so you can see you can get a little bit of that crass, like hard line. So again, this area here, a mount, that helps. Move it here, give it a bit more. You know, it's sort of just like, it sort of like feathers the effect. So that's helped quite a lot, right? But again, it's if you're going to go whole hog on it, it's going to look freaking terrible. Like, just like, don't do that. Like, that's going to look terrible. If I can tell what you've done in your edits, it's it's just don't do it. Like, you know, keep it simple. Less is always more. Obviously, I'm going hardcore in this to show you the effect. But the way you don't get that line is to select the right types of colors in the beginning. 
to not overdo it with your edits and to use this amount here to feather it out, to feather out the effect. So like that's way darker. Look, I'll take away that gradient. You can see the before and after. Okay, like hello. Oh my God. Okay. And there we go. We've added it back. So there you go. That's how we do that. So now let's do one on, let's like oomph the highlights, quote unquote, in the rocks. Okay. So let's do it with the brush this time just to mix things up. Okay. Let's zero back to effect. Let's bump up highlights, bump up whites massively and like a little bit of exposure. Okay. And I'm just going to paint, 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 paint. Okay doing this so crassly oh my god obviously like you would finesse this like a lot more do 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 paint, 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 paint. okay so that's that right okay so that looks terrible yes it does so let's go down to range mask now luminance okay here is remember here is our range dark on the right on the left light on the right i only want these effects up here to affect the light part of the of the image that i selected so look so it's see here so look whole range bring it in only affecting the lighter areas in that tonal range okay so that's how i would get it and obviously like hello we would finesse this to the nth degree go in here get in close just kind of give that a bit more how you going and you can be a lot more crass with it when you're doing this because that range mask is coming into effect. But I just want to do this because I can't stand to look at that. It just looks terrible. Okay. Because if I can tell you've dodged and burned or I can tell you've added something with a brush, like if I can tell, you haven't done it right. So you've got to learn how to finesse. So look here, if we'll just like see this effect. Hold on. It's minimal. So you see, bringing up, look, I can even boost it more without exposure. So you see, that's what it was. And we're just adding a bit more like, ooh, a bit of oomph. And look, oh my God, look, this is killing me here. So that's how I did that. And obviously, again, that's a crass version of how I got that going on. This was sort of the version I ended up on. I didn't bring the sky down near as much because uh, that's just my style. The other style might be yours. I don't like super saturated or super highly edited work. And one other thing that I did was I did a tiny little brush mask here on the moon. So I just brought the highlights in a smidge. So you can see like just a little, just a little to give it a little bit more detail. The information is there on the raw file. I'm just telling it, bring it back in. So with those two landscapes, I hope I've shown you how, I think the main thing I want you to take out of it is don't just do global adjustments, especially with landscapes, okay? Like with this image here, if I, I could probably get something quite close to this in camera with a gradient glass filter, right? But like a normal gradient, like a gradient filter in Lightroom, it's still going to affect the tops of those dunes. So I'd have to push the gradient a lot further up. So in post, I can kind of finesse it a bit more than just, you know, doing it in camera. But I always recommend doing everything in camera if you can. But if you can't, this is a good way to go with the range mask. It's going to change the way you edit stuff, I promise. Okay, so let's head back to our slideshow. Hold on. We have a question from Steph and Lizette. Yes. Yes, it would. So I shoot with, a, well, mostly I shoot with a Canon, a Canon 5D Mark III. And so, oh, I might need to repeat the question because no one heard what you said. Okay, so the question is, uh, there are two people who are watching. Hey, they are following along in their own Lightroom and they do not have a camera neutral option in their color profile up the top. Okay, so let's just quickly go back into Lightroom so everyone can understand what I'm talking about. Let me just open it up. 
So it was up here. See my profile? So I shoot, you can see there's a whole bunch of different ones in here. Um, when you first like buy Lightroom and you open it up, it probably only has the Adobe color profiles, right? So when you, uh, I shoot on a Canon 5D Mark III and I have loaded into Lightroom for, uh, when I installed it, I think, uh, the Canon 5D Mark III color profiles. And these all these updates, I think they come in the updates. Like when you update your Lightroom, if a new camera comes out, you know, uh, Adobe, they will make a color profile for those cameras. Like this, they'll get the color profile from the cameras and put it into the program so that you can have it. So you might need to update your driver, your camera driver for your Lightroom. Just Google that. I can chuck a link up later in the comments for you to follow on how to do that. Um, but also, for example, like if you load other things into your Lightroom, like presets, um, they will appear in your color profiling as well. So, for example, I shoot a lot of film, but I also shoot a lot of digital. And if I'm doing a shoot where it's film and digital, I might add a sort of a filmy effect to some of the digital shots. Um, and I do that with either with Visco or I do them with ones that I make. So I make LUTs. That's a whole other level of stuff. But you can see over here in my in my presets on the left, I've got Visco presets. And so here in my color profiles, I will have film profile color profiles. So you've got like Fuji, um, I've got Canon, Portra, Superior, I've got Ilford for black and white. See, I've got all those. So they will appear in there as well. Uh, but for me, camera neutral, that is from my Canon camera. And you'll also see there's like um, standard. Um, standard and landscape are those color profiles on your camera. So just look at your camera driver if you've got the right camera drivers loaded into Lightroom. So that was a great question. Hope I answered it properly. Okay, so let's go back into our, our little slideshow here. Okay, so that's pretty much the only landscapes we're going to talk about because I, I don't want this to be a whole thing of this is like how you edit stuff um, because we could just be here for days. And also, the way I edit, I don't want you to edit the way I edit. I want you, you can learn from me and everyone needs to be creating their own style. And I, and I had a really good question in the last YouTube live about, well, like, how do you create your own style? And that just comes from experience. It comes from shooting and it can't like a lot and many different things. And it comes from uh doing lots of different edits so you know making virtual copies of one image and then editing it editing it different ways to see what you like as a photographer and what I like is going to be different to what you like and what I like is you is based on what colors I like to shoot the light I like to shoot in like if you like to shoot in bright sunlight a lot or heavy shadow or cloudy days I'm not going to teach you the way I shoot I edit necessarily because I often shoot in airy backlight so I'm not going to teach you how to do that um, so I just recommend to everyone that they experiment with different um, Lightroom techniques or Photoshop techniques but again I, I honestly shoot it in the right light and it will always be good and you keep your edits minimal with the most of my edits they take me three seconds and it's minimal um, I, those two is like where I'll get heavy into it. That's probably the most I'll ever do. Um, so I, I really believe in keeping it simple. Okay. So, oh my God, I am talking a lot. I said this was going to go for an hour. I'm such a liar. Okay. So the next thing we're going to go to is like analog street photography. So anytime I do street photography, it's analog. Um, and there's many reasons for that. I, I, for shooting film, doing street photography, it has a look that I like, uh, I'm a predominantly a film shooter and also I really believe that shooting a small analog camera on the street puts people at ease. If people know you're shooting them, they tend to not care as much than if you're there with a massive digital camera. And so I'm going to just kind of go through my process of how I sort of take street photography. So, oh, first we just go through some examples. Ooh. So this is all shot on film and it's this is I think from a trip to Italy and Prague so just different things so sometimes I get right in there and people know I'm there and then sometimes people don't know I'm there this is uh on Ekta Kodak Ekta 
And sometimes I'm just waiting and waiting and doing scenes from a distance. And like, so this guy here on the left, he knew I was there. He knew I was photographing him. And I really believe that he just let me do it because I, I wasn't there with a massive lens or a massive camera. I wasn't going click, 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 taking 800 photos. I took two frames, this frame and one where he looked at me. This is in Rome on the right and Siena on the left in Italy. This is in Florence and Genoa. So probably the shot on the right is like one of my favorite shots. And I like, I just like using people in any kind of travel photography I do. And that's why I like street photography. I just think people, people create scale, people tell story and people tell the story of a place. This is Rome. So this was all, yeah, shot last time I was in Italy. So the lady on the left with the flowers on her head, she she yelled at me after I took the shot. So uh, one of the unfortunate things about having a very old camera is the shutter is very loud. Um, so she heard it and she yelled at me in Italian. And obviously I just apologized. I was like, I'm sorry, Miss Scusi, Miss Scusi. Um, and she just walked past. But I'm pretty sure she said some pretty nasty things to me. So look, sometimes it happens. Sometimes people just tell you to bugger off and just bugger off. But legally, I don't have to. Like I can keep taking photos. Um, but I, I'm not going to. If someone's not comfortable or they've caught me doing it and they don't want me to do it, then I'll stop. And that's just being respectful. Also, most of the time I don't want people to know that I'm doing it because... The whole point is to capture people doing what they're doing in their daily life, not, you know, them being aware to the fact that I'm there. So there is an art to of to being inconspicuous. And obviously, like, I am 5 foot 10 and I have a giant blonde bun. I am not inconspicuous. Um, and this definitely is not the way to shoot street photography, okay? No big lenses no multiple cameras, no flash. Like this is like the the anti everything, this whole situation. This is what I kind of like to think you should be more like when you're shooting street photography, right? Sneaky, assassin, detective. This is what I like to think I look like when I'm doing street photography. That's what I like to think I look like. But really, this is what I look like. <laughs> so obviously... I have a partner who likes to paparazzi pat me when I'm taking photos. <laughs> so this is what I look like. This is the camera I shoot on. This is what's in my bag. This is all I take. I take a bloody 1957 uh, Pentax Bockmatic SP1000 and I shoot on a, a little 50mm 1.8 and I take a ton of film. So I shoot for color. I only shoot uh, Ecto-100. And for black and white, I only shoot Ilford and it's HP5 or FP4. But like whatever you want to shoot, man, whatever's in, in your film bag, go for it. But also like, yes, I shoot film. But if you have a small digital camera that can be quite silent or your iPhone, go for it. There's this um, amazing photographer, Andrew um, Quilty, and he on his Instagram um it's only mostly, I think mostly iPhone photos. He lives in Kabul in Afghanistan and he can kind of get into different places and do daily life shots because he's just shooting on a little iPhone and no one's kind of like, you know, making a big deal out of it. You know what I mean? So here's some of my tips. Use a small camera, obviously. Yeah, go mirrorless, go iPhone or go like a small analog film camera. Like people are going to be so much less intimidated with all of that. Use a small lens, go a 35, a 24, a 50. You don't need, like, definitely the closer you can get, the better. You know what I mean? If you're shooting, like, on a 200 mil, like, you're just going to look like a weird paparazzo. Like, it's just going to be strange. Try and be sneaky and stealthy. Like, I have a lot of techniques that I use where I'll pretend to be photographing something else and then I just turn and I go, bang! And I, and I photograph what I really want to photograph. So you got to get really good at knowing where your focus points are on a manual focusing lens, like to sort of range find it. I act super casual and I take as fewer frames as possible. 
Like I'm not there going click, 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 click. No, I've only got 36 shots in the camera and I'm going to wait. I'm going to just wait for that perfect moment and then I'm going to go snap and then I've got it. Also, like if people know I am there, if it's like a situation where it's like a street party or like like those old guys having a chat and playing chess, I'm just going to go up there and be like super friendly, be like, hey, you know, photo. And I just, you know, and I kind of get involved with it. But if people tell you to bugger off, like just bugger off. Um, so yeah, I wait, wait, wait. I observe. I wait again. I shoot once. And if it's good, I kind of keep going with it. But the, the main point is to be stealth, to not be invasive. And you just like, don't be a douchebag. So this is a shot I took in Venice. And I'm just quickly going to show you like the post. So like, I send it off. I used to develop all the film myself um, uh, in my laundry, but I don't do that anymore. I get it done by Rewind Photo Lab, shout out, in Glebe. They develop it all for me, send it back my way, and then I scan it here on um, a flatbed scanner that has a neg a neg holder in it. So this is how it comes out as flat. I scan these negs as flat as I can. So I'm um, and I'm not going to go through that process because most of you probably don't shoot film. I try and I try and make the curve as flat as possible. I don't want any characteristic curve going on that. No contrast. I select my highlights and bring them down. I select my shutters and bring them up and I make this negative as flat as I can. And then I bring it in to Lightroom and as a TIFF um, or a DNG, whatever you want, and I edit it. So you can see here. I've done a bit with the characteristic curve, but mostly I'm really adding a lot of sharpening too because I don't like to add too much sharpening from the flatbed scanner, but it's like pretty basic. I've boosted the exposure, boosted the highlights a bit, the shadows a bit, the whites. As you can see, that makes like a huge difference, but really a lot of the work I'm doing in here in my, in my curve. So that's, that's really basic, but the main deal point of that is to scan your negative as flat as you can. So yeah, then I end up scanning everything and then it goes on the web. So it's like a hybrid shooting situation, which I'm very much into. Okay, so now we're going to quickly get into backlit portraits because I'm really conscious of the time. So this is like, this is like a, a key thing of how I shoot portraits. And I'm going to go through a whole bunch and then I'm going to quickly show you tell you how to shoot it properly and then how to edit properly. So this is all backlit portraits. And they're all sort of taken at very different times of the day. This is like three. This is like pretty harsh light, but I've made it work. Well, I, I think I have. Again, backlit. I just find it gives an air to an image. It gives way more of a mood to an image. And it's just a bit different. That's my husband. I just like it. And he's my dog. <laughs> Aww. So you can see some of the effects are greater than others. And that is all about where you place your body. And the key to it is getting flare. So on the left, that is a nice backlit portrait. You've got a rim light kind of situation. But if I move my body a little bit and I get that flare, because that's the key is the flare into the lens, then I get something really different. So the two very, two very different images, but all I've done is move my body. That's all I've done. So with exposure, I'll just go back. For example, let me go all the way back to the wedding shot in the beginning. The exposure is her skin tone on her cheek. That's the exposure. If So I take a spot reading off her cheek. If I just le like listen to my meter and it's on average metering, it's always going to be too dark because it's trying to balance it out to mid-gray and it's taking into account this massive light source. So spot meter, that cheek, or to be honest, I don't even bother spot metering. I just know. I just know what the exposure is going to be. So I just... I just over like it's probably over by one and a half stops so the more you do it the more you get to know it so same here again the black and white shot I'm exposing for his and her face and then everything's just blowing out behind them same here I'm exposing and I've got a good example of this actually let's transition into Lightroom let's open it back up 
and I will show you exactly what I mean with this exposure. This is what the meter is telling me because the sun is shining right into the lens. So of course it's going to try and balance out all those tones and that looks terrible. That is not going to work. So that's why you need to know how to adjust your exposure correctly for different scenes and different looks. So I expose for her face or his face and the whole back gets blown out and it creates this air. I get a little bit of flare in the lens and it creates perfect exposure on them. Lots of flare, lots of backlight, so much better. Like that looks terrible. Obviously, I could fill that with flash you know, on that exposure, but I'm going to get a different look, aren't I? It's going to look flashy. It's going to look like way too uh, sharp. So here, obviously, with backlight, you you get a softness. It's never going to be super, super sharp. And you do tend to get a lot of lens aberration, a lot of chromatic aberration. So you've got to be careful of that and you can fix that in post in your Lightroom. You can fix chromatic aberration. So that's a really good example of how what your camera says is not the right exposure. You have to rely on your knowledge of the zone system, of what skin tones should be. Skin tone is all, white skin tone is always plus one. Dark skin tone is usually minus a stop, minus half a stop, depending on the person you're photographing. So that's really important too. I, I've, a lot of photographers do not know how to meter for dark skin. I could do a whole other thing on it. Okay, let's go back. Alrighty. So expose for the skin tone. Plus one stop. Obviously for Bandit, he was not plus one stop. He's a black dog. But yeah, and it's all about maneuvering your body to get that flare or to not get the flare. It depends what you want. I wanted flare there, so I moved my body and I just let it flood straight in. And I don't, I don't have a lens hood on, obviously. It's another type of version of it on like a wider scale. And you, I don't just do it for portraits. I do it for everything. I love backlight. So you can see here with the bush and I'm getting the flare and the backlight. So I'm just exposing for, for the for sort of for the front of that bush and I'm probably looking at it going, okay, it's half a stop under mid-gray and then it just floods in and it gets the right exposure for that green bush. I do it with Edda, my, my combi. So I'm exposing probably for the front, the front near the front indicator. I'm getting that exposure point to what I want it to be in the zone system and then everything else just falls into place. Again, dust, backlight, perfect situation. Tree, backlit. If I listen to my meter, this I'm not going to get this look. I have to overexpose it. And that's all about knowing rules and then knowing how to break them to get different looks. Again, same thing. Not as extreme. Okay. Balancing on camera flash. So kind of like what we were talking about before. I think this is the, the second last bit I'm going to show you. But now we're talking about when the camera is on top of – the flash is on top of your camera. Okay. So I use – let me just transition back to webcam so you can see me for a second. So I use, because I'm a Canon shooter, I use a 580EX and I chuck that straight on top of my hot shoe on the top. And if I'm shooting an event, wedding, whatever, people, I'm going to pull this little dubawacky up and I'm going to bounce it off the roof. So in this shot, I'm in a gazebo kind of thing. And the flash is bouncing up to the roof and coming down on top of them. And then this little bit here is shooting uh, light onto their face. Okay, so they're in a gazebo. This is, again, it's hitting the roof of the gazebo, sh pouring down on top of them, and then this little thing is filling their face, okay? But if you have a situation where the roof is too high or it's too dark or whatever, you just point it straight at them and you add some kind of diffuser thing on the front to soften it, and then you just, bam, you shoot them. Um, so I'll set the lens, sorry, I'll set the flash to ETTL and I'll usually go like plus a stop for skin tone. And normally that will give me the right, it will decide what the right light will be. Because again, the light, is, the light from the flash is coming back into the diode on top of the flash and then it's adjusting it to plus one stop. Okay. 
Um, or you can go to manual and you can set it to to what you want, like one over sixteenth or whatever, and you can just keep shooting it like that. But the the way to balance it, uh, your your flash is to balance it with ambient light. So I'm not um, underexposing this background at all. I'm getting a light reading for the scene, and then I'm filling it with flash. Okay, so the flash is not the predominant thing going on here. Okay. Because if you don't balance, like if you don't balance flash, it looks terrible. This is a better example because I'm in a very dark room. This is a wedding, and you will always be shooting on camera flash in a situation like this at a reception. So we'll go here with the lady in the green. So if I don't have fill flash, she's gonna be too dark. So I get an ambient light reading for the room, and then I fill her with flash. And the problem where people go wrong is they think that the flash is going to do all the work for them. And so, oh, it's a dark room. I want a low ISO. I don't want grain, blah, blah, blah. I'll underexpose the room by two stops. No, that's going to look terrible. Your room's going to be black and your person is just going to be flashed. And it's going to look terrible. So it's all about balancing those two exposures. Yes, you're going to have to shoot at a higher ISO. Hello, you're going to. There's no way around it. You're in a dark room. You have to balance that ambient light. If you don't, your photo is going to look terrible. Like it's going to look shit. It's better to have a grainy photo than to have a badly uh, lit photo because you can't change that. So you get that ambient light reading. This probably, just by looking at it, would have been like 1600 ISO, 1 over 100 at probably f4, f5.6, just by looking at it. And then I add in that flash Again, I'm bouncing it onto the roof and then the front little white panel is bouncing straight onto her or I'm pointing it directly at her and I'm diffusing it, okay? And that's just a fine balance and that's how you balance flash and there's going to be some more examples of this here. Again, so this is balanced. Very dark room. But if I don't get some level of ambient light reading for the room, it's going to be black and then they're just going to be heavily lit with flash it's not going to harmonize or balance and also you have to take into account the light temperature like I, I don't do this a lot I kind of like the look of the white light on the people and the sort of orangey tungsten look behind but you can get these cool things that go over your flash and they're called like correction filters so like this one here would be oh let me go back to webcam this one would be like for tungsten because it's like orange hello there's ones for fluorescent and they like literally they just sit over the top and they change the color of your flash so that you can balance it with the color temperature of the room so that's another way to do it as well but I personally I don't do that a lot I only do it if it's like oh if it looks terrible um so for, for instance in in this shot it's just the white the white flash bouncing off the roof because also the roof is a certain color. That's going to create a color cast as well. And yeah, without flash, this would look terrible. Here's the couple. Again, just balancing that flash. I used to be so bad at this until I assisted my wedding photographer at a wedding he did and he just showed me how to do it. I was like, oh my God, that makes so much sense. Again, nicely balanced. So flash versus no flash, okay? So this is flash. Oh, 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 go back. This is flash. Um, this is a wedding I did a couple of weeks ago. Um, nicely balanced. This is no flash, okay? So the main difference is the lenses. I've had for me to get this shot, I've had to change lenses. I've had to go to a, a 50 mil 1.4 or a 50 mil 1.8 because I've had to open up all the way to 1.8. This is like F4. So the bonus of using flash in this situation is more is in focus. So the people on the left and right of her are going to be more in focus. And also when you're in a vet, this room was so dark, I can't even tell you. It was like candle lit. Also a benefit of flash is the flash is going to focus for you. It is going to focus those people. It sends out a red diode light onto their face and it focuses the camera for you. When it's just me and no flash, I've got to do all the focusing. I've got to have a lens that is really good at focusing in the dark. Whereas if you have the flash, it will focus for you. 
it helps you focus but you know i like the look of no flash as well you can make it work this is flash very different look right she's perfectly in focus it's about f4 maybe f5 6 more is in focus there's a look to it there's a look to it this is is no flash at all the 50 mil i think this is like a 24 to 105 f4 this is a 50 mil 1.8 and obviously, again, I've had to open up to 1.8 or F2, but it gives a nice airy look because like, you know, it's really shallow depth of field. So that's a look that can work. So you just have to decide what's going to work. But also this is going to freeze action. This is not. So you have to keep that in mind as well. That's with flash. That's without. A very different look. So you just have to, you know, if people are moving fast or you need help focusing, you might want to use flash. Like you might just want to do that. Like the bride's coming down. It was basically, it's nighttime. The bride's coming down the aisle. I'm going to be using flash because I need that flash to freeze her and I need it to light her properly and I need to have a fast shutter speed. I can't be shooting that at like 1 over 40. She's going to be, have motion blur. Okay, final bit. And then like, we're totally done. I'm so sorry for keeping you so long. This I just thought I would include because it's a sh it's a project I did like oh my god like eight years ago and I'm showing it to you just so you can it's just something different. I shot it all with video and I took stills from the video and I had a whole exhibition. It was this piece called Compassion Fatigue and basically what I did I filmed people watching horrific imagery on a loop for like half an hour and I took stills in the same point of each loop and how they fatigued by watching this imagery from the first time they watched it to the last time they watched it which was like the 40th time and then I did comparisons so you can see the top image is when they first see this one part of horrific imagery and then the bottom shot is when they see it for the 40th time the exact same thing and I called it compassion fatigue the project and it's it's pretty obvious what it's about. It's about, you know, at the onslaught of media. And I think we can kind of all relate to that at the moment with COVID-19. We might have all like maybe switched off to that just a little bit because it's just on the news all the time, constantly. And so it was a piece that I did with funding from NAVA and from the Chrissy Cotter Gallery. I got, I got, they gave me money to do it. And I, and I, I just thought it'd be something interesting, uh, an interesting take on like social commentary. So here's some more. I'm not going to tell you what they watched. But people fatigued. What I realized is people fatigued in different ways. Some people just became blasé to it. Some people blocked their ears, covered their eyes. And some people just looked more traumatized. And I found it was really interesting to see how different people reacted to this constant onslaught of imagery being looped. So you can see people, people just totally disconnecting and, and people self-protecting. There was a lot of like self-protective body language going on. And so it was presented as a big exhibition with video. So I'll just play you a little bit, just a little smidge of what it looked like. There's no audio, so I might talk over it. So these were projected huge onto the gallery walls. And so everyone is looking at the exact same thing at the exact same time. It's all perfectly time-coded. And you can see everyone's different reactions. So this is right in the beginning. And you can see, you know, they wince, they turn away, they bring their hands to their face, they, they, they turn their nose up. Some people cried. The girl in the middle down the bottom, she cried. And then the next bit is like after, you know, 30 minutes of this. So you can see people are just trying to tune out, blocking ears, closing eyes, completely disconnected from it. And like some are just like a bit traumatized. I felt like kind of bad. Like they knew what they were getting into. But so this was, yeah, and I had two walls and I had the whole thing about it was one wall of faces was people watching animal slaughter and the other wall was people watching human slaughter. And what I sort of derived from the findings um, was that people were more desensitized to human slaughter than animal slaughter. Because obviously you don't see animal slaughter a lot, 
but human slaughter like you know uh, human suffering it's, it's on the news all the time you know violent films whatever people were very much desensitized to that but animal slaughter no like not not desensitized so the, yeah this is sort of like a bit of the exhibition you can see here the wall of one of the walls of the projections and then i did these stills and so i took the stills from the high definition video but the why i wanted to show you this was because of how i shot it this is how i shot it this is the set and i'm, I'm showing this to you because it's just different it's just like thinking outside the box so the person the the subject sat in the seat and they had the two constant um lighting sources on them the black background this was in my old studio in Balmain and then there's this pane of glass okay this is very important and you can see my tripod here on the right hand side obviously I'm holding the camera because I'm taking the photo but that's where my camera would be and so I'm shooting through the pane of glass onto the person because when these people are looking at me when these people they're looking at me they are looking down the barrel of the lens okay they are looking down the barrel of the lens. They're not looking to the left or the right, above or below. They're looking down the barrel. They could not see the camera at all. All they could see was this. So here's the person sitting, looking through the pane of glass. But if you're in the seat, you can see my laptop, which was playing the video of what they were watching looped time and time again, just looping it. And so it's reflecting up, so everything had to be mirrored. And so they're looking at the screen, but really behind that virtual image is my camera lens. And that's how I shot it. And I completely ripped off the idea from Errol Morris, who's a documentary filmmaker. He did the, um, the where he interviews um, McNamara, the guy, Secretary of State, for when Vietnam was on. So that's how I did it. So gaining inspiration from documentary film, taking it into a different space, where I'm getting still imagery from it as well as video. But I just thought I would show you that because it just kind of gets you outside of the box of like just thinking of different things. And like we all have so much time now to be doing things and we can start like experimenting with different things, like different ways of shooting, experiment with your lighting. You can practice on camera flash in your home. You just need like a person to shoot. Um, you know, practicing those different editing techniques. So that's it. So I will just say, this is my social media handle, at Sounds Like Mez. You can get me on all the socials. You are on my website right now. You can buy my work, go up the top to buy prints. That'll take you to my print store if you wish, if you want. Uh, but also I have a podcast. So I have a photography podcast with my good friend, Toby. He's a photo, he's a photographer and a journalist and it's available everywhere you get podcasts it's called click click bang bang a photography podcast we're on all the socials if you're really bored like especially during this time listen to some of the back episodes we give a lot of good advice we're going to have some guests coming up and also like i talked a lot before about toby the guy who shoots with me a lot of the time his handle is um Faragio photographic please check him out he's awesome he shoots brilliant architecture work at the moment uh, and some great travel stuff. He's really great. Check out his socials. So that's it. So let me ask Sean if there's any questions. Sean, questions. So hold on, I'll just say, if you have a question, ask it now down below and Sean is going to read them out. So you got to get in now. We've only got like 10 more minutes, five more minutes. Ask your questions now and ask me anything. Sean. Okay, going back to the travel photography. You recommended that people shoot with small cameras. Oh, yeah, the street stuff. Do you have any recommendations on small digital cameras that someone might look at? Okay, so someone's asking, do you have any recommendations for some small digital cameras that people might look at? Honestly, like, I'm not a massive gearhead. Like, I know a lot about gear, but I just feel like, oh, I don't really want to get into a gear wars, but go mirrorless if you want to do travel photography like if you want to do street photography mirrorless is really good because it's small and it's silent like it doesn't make a it has no shutter so it doesn't make a shutter sound i don't particularly like mirrorless i don't i don't like shooting it i don't i don't like it at all um but you can do that get yourself i i mean look i'm a canon shooter so uh they have the canon r i think it is toby my friend he shoots with that and it's great for video 
And it's great if you have a smaller lens on there, like a 50. It's really light. It's quiet. So yeah, go with that. Check out the, the Canon R. That's their mirrorless. But also, look, Fuji do a whole bunch of good mirrorless. But like, it's going to cost you. It's expensive. And, but to be honest, like I, I shoot um, my uh, 5D Mark III with a 50 mil. You know, or you could shoot it with like a little pancake lens, like a 24 or even a 30, the 35s are a bit big. But if you can just get yourself a little lens, like a little 50 or a little 24, your SLR body is going to be small enough. Put it on silent shutter if you have like a, a higher end camera and that can work for you. My camera is very loud. My analog camera is really loud. It's like clunk, wind, right? So it doesn't necessarily have to be silent, but I just feel like just use a smaller lens. Um, one thing I do also is I use my analog lenses on my digital camera. Uh, my analog lenses for my Pentax are in M42 mount and I have an M42 to full frame Canon uh, EF converter. I got it from Gobe, G-O-B-E, gobe.com. They are fantastic. Oh my God, they are so good. Um, and I put like my 35 on that. Because my 35 analog uh, lens is so small compared to a digital 35 mil. Like I think the Canon 35 mil is like that big. Um, so hold on, I'm going to transition back here so you can see me because I'm doing a lot of hand actions. So yeah, I, I do that as well. So it's not necessarily about, oh, I need a new camera. Just think about how you can minimize your kit you already have. Like don't have a battery pack on there. You know, pick a small lens. Try that. You don't have to always go out and buy more gear. Or get an old camera, really cheap. Shauna, any more questions? Uh, everyone's just saying thanks for the list. Learn heaps. Excellent. Learn heaps. Excellent. Steph has said thanks. Steph. Can you talk to another hour or so? Steph, Steph. <laughs> I feel, I don't know if you are Steph, but I feel like that was a bit of a dig. I'm really sorry. I talk a lot. I literally could talk for another hour, but I won't. No, but she, uh, she really enjoyed it. And oh, that's good. People are enjoying it. Thanks, Lizette, for listening to Click, Click, Bang, Bang. Um, no more questions. No more questions. Okay, I'm going to do one more spiel. And so if you have any more questions, ask them now because I'm about to go. So again, I just want to say thanks to St. George um, Lee's Club Photographic Society for um, sponsoring this event. Um, thanks. And like I said, like that is your OG Instagram right there is a, is a camera club or a photographic society. A lot of people think that, you know, they're for like older people or it's not cool. That's like such BS. There's a lot of young people. Um, there's a lot of age ranges in these clubs and they are the original Instagram and they are so ballsy because it's really easy to put your photo on Instagram or Facebook and hide behind the cover of a website or whatever. It's really ballsy to get up once a week in person and show your work to other people, have someone come in and judge it in front of everyone, you know? It's like ballsy, you know? But a lot of these camera clubs, they're kind of moving away from this like judging business and it's more like a like a photographic collective where they all just like share ideas, give each other feedback. And it's like, it's really great community group. And I think like when this virus situation is over, People are going to want to reconnect with people in person and that's a great way to do it. So, you know, you can just like get on the Googles and search for your local club, but I really recommend it. it it's not for everyone, um, but if you are if you want some social connection, you know, and you want to improve your photography and you want to meet people who are like-minded, it's a really great thing to do. So I thank them again and also, yeah, check out my socials at Sounds Like Mez. Buy some stuff if you want to. Check out the podcast. You've got so much stuff to do. And thank you all so much for tuning in. I'm so sorry I spoke so much. But I just wanted you to take away from this certain things, like about directing people, about editing certain ways, you know, not overdoing it, and like how I do certain things that emphasize my style. And nothing should ever be about copying. It should always be about like taking information that you get and using it and developing your own style and your own way of shooting and your own voice in photography because we don't all want to copy each other. How boring. Oh, my God, so boring. So, yeah, any more questions? Steph just says it wasn't a dig. She loved it. Thanks. 
Oh, good. No, I know. I didn't think it was a dick. All right. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. And catch us. We might do this again sometime. Oh, my God. Let's do it. All right. Ciao.